Hello, everybody. Welcome, one and all, to the Queen's University 2021 CAVE Lecture. My name is Sarah Sadovoy, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Physics, Engineering Physics, and Astronomy here at Queen's. I wish to also thank the McDonald Institute for providing the wonderful technical wizardry that is bringing this lecture to you virtually today. Uh, before we get started, I would like to first acknowledge that Queen's University and where I am in Kingston, Ontario, are on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Moreover, our speaker who is joining us today comes from Long Island, New York, and the traditional lands specifically of the Montaukett people, although we would like to recognize that the area of Long Island is the ancestral territory for 13 Indigenous communities. In particular, as we approach the first ever National Truth and Reconciliation Day here in Canada, it is especially important that we remember and recognize the impact of colonialism on Indigenous communities and the need to make genuine strides forward to truth and reconciliation. I myself am still learning and growing in my understandings of historic and current colonial uh, institutional practices that affect Indigenous communities today, and also how physics is a part of that discussion. As many of you are joining us from other locations, I encourage you to learn more about your own local history. Some great resources are the websites native-land.ca and whose.land. Uh, I also encourage you in joining me and wearing an orange shirt tomorrow on uh, September 30th uh, in support of our Indigenous communities and the goal that we all have to reach healing and reconciliation. So thank you. Uh, today we are talking about uh, a little bit of history though with astronomy through the CAVE lecture, which is a public lecture hosted by the physics department at Queens. Uh, the event is named for Harold M. CAVE, a former professor at our university from 1930 to 1957. He generously provided funds for school, student scholarships and also for this lecture series. The CAVE lecture aims to bring well-known speakers to Queens so that they may share uh, interesting topics in physics with our university as well as the wider Kingston community and it is with absolute great pleasure that I introduce the 2021 CAVE lecture speaker uh, Deva Sobel. Would you like to uh, join us on screen please? Hello, thank you. Hi Sarah. Excellent. So uh, Deva Sobel exemplifies exactly what the CAVE lecture series is known for. Uh, she is a renowned science author with two wonderful passions in science writing. Her books include Longitude, Galileo's Daughter, The Planets, um, A More Perfect Heaven, and The Glass Universe. She is also a regular contributor and the editor of the science poetry column in the Scientific America called Meter. She has also written for Harvard Magazine, Omni, Science Digest, Discover, and The New Yorker. She has received numerous awards, including four honorary doctorates, an LA Times Book Prize, and the Bradford Washburn Award for Outstanding Contribution Toward Public Understanding of Science. Today, she is going to take us a walk through the history of the Harvard College Observatory and the women astronomers at the observatory who mapped the sky. So thank you for everyone for joining us on this live stream. If you are on the live stream, you will have an opportunity to ask questions through the chat feature on YouTube. We will collect those questions at the end and ask them of our wonderful speaker. But for now, Deva, welcome to our virtual space. Thank you so much for being with us today. And we very much look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. It was very easy to get here today. I, I rather like this, this way of giving lectures. Of course, it's nice to see people too, but I think even more people can get together uh, than, than would be able to in person. The, uh, the topic of my talk tonight is, is women's work at the dawn of astrophysics. And this was the topic of the most recent book, which I'm I'm going to show shamelessly, and it's called The Glass Universe. The title immediately brings to mind the glass ceiling, and that was intentional. But the real reason I called the book The Glass Universe is because of a new technology that was prevalent at the dawn of astrophysics that made many advances possible. And I have a little show and tell here. So this is a glass photographic plate. 
typical of the Harvard collection of glass photographic plates. Uh, it's an image that was taken in the Southern Hemisphere, and it shows an object that, that we cannot see here in the Northern Hemisphere. It's the small Magellanic cloud. And the woman who was studying this image made an extremely important discovery, which I will talk about later. But uh, you can see that in addition to the to the images of the stars, this is a, a negative, so the stars are black on a white background. But there's a lot of writing on the plate, a lot of numbers written in. And that was how they worked. So they they would have the glass plates in front of them with the emulsion side facing away. And then they could actually write on the glass surface in colored ink. But I am going to share my screen with you just a moment. Okay, sorry for that little delay. All right, can you, can you all, okay, great. I think you can see that now. Uh, so this is the Harvard Observatory, Harvard College Observatory, as you can see in the year 1847. And it's obviously an observatory with those giant domes. Uh, but over here is a, is a part of the building that doesn't have a dome. And that's a house, a real house. That's where the director of the observatory lived. And that situation not only made life convenient for the director, but it was a natural opening for the director's family to move themselves into the observatory and make themselves useful, which happened a lot. So the director was invariably a man, but his wife might work in the observatory, his daughters, sisters, uh, and some of the other astronomers who would come to work would would bring female members of their families to help out. This is a, a typical scene. So women's work at the outset was really computing. Uh, observatories always had computers, which was a job description until relative, relatively recent times because there was a lot of computing to be done, computing orbits, uh, relative brightness of stars, trying to tell distances of one thing from another. Uh, so there was computing work to be done. Um, Edward Pickering was the fourth director of the observatory. And this is a picture of him about the time he took over as director at Harvard. There was some objection to his getting the job because he was not an astronomer. He was a physicist, uh, but he, he seemed like the right person for the job and he certainly proved to be just what they were looking for. So he arrived in 1877 and when he got there, he discovered that there were already several women working in the observatory, which probably struck him as a little bit unusual. But he quickly realized that that was, that was actually just fine because they could do the work and they weren't paid as much as the men. So it was very economical. But uh, Pickering really was in favor of women's education, higher education. And that was unusual at the time. This, this is the title page of a book that um, 
looks like it's in favor of, of education, but it's actually an argument against higher education for women on the grounds that if a young woman spends a lot of time and energy pushing herself to learn things, then she'll actually do harm to her reproductive organs. And this, this was put forward by, by a medical doctor. And um, uh, Pickering thought that was ridiculous and thought it would be really great if a lot of women contributed observations to astronomy. And then they could prove that not only uh, could they do the work and advance the science, but it didn't hurt them either. And in fact, um, the American Association of University Women, its, its first mission was to debunk this idea. And they did it by interviewing women who had college degrees and finding out that indeed they had children. Not all of them, but enough to, to make the case. So Pickering's big innovation was to start taking photographs of the night sky. In fact, the first image of a star through a telescope was taken at Harvard long before he got there. But that telescope wasn't really built for taking photographs. And Pickering helped develop several telescopes that were specifically for making photographs of the night sky. Uh, this is uh, obvious, obviously to most of you as part of the Orion constellation and the uh, Orion Nebula. And uh, when, I, when I first saw this picture, it reminded me of this image from Galileo's book, The Starry Messenger. And what Galileo showed when he looked at Orion through his rudimentary telescope was that all of a sudden, there were many more stars in that constellation than people had been aware of. And that's exactly what happened with the introduction of photography. Suddenly, you could see many more stars, not because there was a greater power of magnification than using the tel telescope by itself, but because light could accumulate on the plates through long exposures and very faint stars would show up that that no one no one had ever seen so most of the images were negatives like this one so the stars appear black on a white background uh, but some of them are of transient phenomena of interest. Yeah, sorry. And um, Pickering's greatest project started out with a, a love story. Uh, these, these people are Dr. Henry Draper and his wife, Anna Palmer Draper. And Henry was the first person to succeed at taking a photograph of a stellar spectrum. So the, the star's light spread out into its component colors. And this opened up a way to show the chemical composition of the stars, something people had long thought could never be known because there would be no way to sample material from a star. But with the spectrum, the characteristic lines of certain elements showed up. And uh, Henry liked to say that the spectroscope had made the chemist's arms millions of miles long. And he started doing one at a time photos of the spectra of individual stars. And this was so thrilling, such a promising field of endeavor that he was going to give up his medical career. He was a medical doctor and he taught at a medical school in New York City. 
but he had a private observatory upstate and he wanted to take his wife who was his observing partner and move up to this observatory where they would devote themselves to taking these images and not only determining the chemical makeup of the stars, but being able to create a classification system based on the spectra. So um, many of you have seen this uh, textbook image of, of a spectrum. And so there's this rainbow background, but then there are the dark lines that reveal the uh, the chemicals that that can be seen in the in the solar spectrum. And the other advantage of having a spectrum is you can you can detect movement in the stars, whether they are moving toward or away from the observer by the way the lines are shifted. Of course, there was no color photography yet, so Henry's images looked like this, all shades of gray and black and white. And uh, uh, this is Anna's formal portrait. Unfortunately, as soon as they had their lives in order to make this transition to their private observatory, Henry contracted pneumonia and, and died at age 45. So uh, his, his widow was heartbroken and uh, determined somehow to realize this dream that they had had together. And she worked out an arrangement with Pickering where the, in which he would do all the work but she would provide the money. And this was terrific for the Harvard Observatory because it didn't receive any funding from the university. All, all of the money had to be raised by subscription. So to have this big infusion of funds was, was really terrific. And it paid for a large staff of female computers who would study the images and try to build this classification system. Uh, so here you see, uh, a, these, this is a posed photograph, but this is pretty much what life looked like in the computing room, studying the plates, writing notes, uh, maybe looking at them not just through a magnifying loop but with a modified uh, microscope uh, this is pickering a little older and more successful and uh, so here's a plate like the one I, I showed you earlier and this is how they would be studied in a wooden frame like this and at the base of the frame, there's a mirror. So again, this, these are posed photographs. So this window shade has been drawn, but it, to be really working, the shade would be up, the light would come through the window, hit the mirror, and then bounce up through the glass and allow the person studying to, to have proper illumination. Um, Pickering modified the way the pictures were taken because he wanted to get many spectra at once, not just the, the one at a time. So on this image, every little smudge that you see here is actually the spectrum of a star. And uh, again, there's a lot of writing. And this big black splotch is a penny, just uh, just for scale. Uh, Williamina Fleming uh, was in that earlier image I showed you. You know, she she was standing among the other women because she was the boss. Uh, she was originally hired at the observatory 
as a domestic servant. And uh, the Pickerings recognized almost immediately how intelligent she was. And it turned out that she had taken this maid's job because, <clears throat> excuse me, she was in, in dire straits. She was pregnant. Her husband, who, with whom she had come to the United States from Scotland, had disappeared. And uh, now she was alone and going to have this baby. So the Pickerings moved her into the observatory, taught her how to analyze plates, look at spectra, make decisions about them. And then they paid for her to go home to Scotland to have her baby. And she was so grateful that she named the baby Edward Charles Pickering Fleming. And they had promised her a real job if she would come back. And she did. When the baby was not quite two, she, she came back and she worked the rest of her life at Harvard. And she became the first woman to have a Harvard University title as the curator of astronomical photographs. Uh, the photographs accumulated so rapidly. So there were several telescopes taking pictures all through the night. And they went to hundreds and then thousands and then hundreds of thousands. So an entire new building had to be constructed just to house these plates and to keep them safe from fire. Uh, so the original observatory building is here in the background. It's a wooden structure, but the new building is made of brick. And it, it had it later had to be expanded a couple of times. Uh, another significant character who came to work was Antonia Mori. And she was the first woman employed at the observatory who actually had a college degree. She had attended Vassar College, uh, where this, this stern looking lady, this is Mariah Mitchell, uh, and she was on the faculty at Vassar teaching astronomy. And Antonia Mori had eight semesters of astronomy with Mariah Mitchell and was graduated with honors in astronomy. And she was also the niece of Henry Draper. So she had every every kind of credential to work there for 25 cents an hour uh, which was the going pay um, i love this caricature of her uh, with her pen in hand um, because she she created a classification system a stellar classification system mrs fleming created the first one, which was published in 1890 as part of the, as, as the Draper catalog. Um, and Miss Morey, because she, she was again looking at stars one at a time, so that she had spectra with a lot more detail in them, she made a more complicated classification system. And Pickering wasn't judging at this point. He just, he just wanted the process to be moving. And he had entrusted this classification process to the women computers. And uh, when Miss Morey's classification was ready for publication, she got a byline in the annals of the Harvard College Observatory. Mrs. Fleming got credit in the introductory note that Pickering wrote, in which he said that she had done all the work. But by the time Miss Morey's system was published, she actually got a byline. Annie Jump Cannon was another college educated employee at the observatory. She had gone to Wellesley College. And uh, here she is at Wellesley. Uh, but by this time, she's she's not a student anymore. She's gone back to uh, 
work as an assistant in the physics and astronomy lab with her professor, Sarah Frances Whiting. Sarah Frances Whiting had been a student of Pickering's when, when he taught, before he took the job at Harvard, he had taught for 10 years at MIT. And he created a physics course in which the students discovered them things for themselves by, by doing experiments. And he had let Sarah Frances Whiting take his course. And they, they stayed in touch ever after. Uh, there was a, a lovely children's book written about Annie Jump Cannon. And this image is, uh, is not a fanciful idea of the illustrators. Annie Jump Cannon actually made telescope observations. She had so much experience from her time at Wellesley that even when she began working at Harvard around 1895, she was right away making observations with a, a six inch telescope on the roof, uh, looking at variable stars. And Miss Cannon was able to meld the best aspects of Mrs. Fleming's system and Miss Morey's system and, and make it her own. And this is one of her annotated glass plates. So again, every, every little smudge, these are all spectra. And then these are notations um, that, that she has made. She was able to dictate a classification, a, a letter classification, almost instantaneously. And so she would work with uh, a scribe. She'd be looking, one person would be looking at the plate, speaking out loud, dictating to a partner who would be writing in the, in the observatory logbooks. Uh, Miss Cannon was uh, a lifetime, lifelong diarist and the, the wonderful thing for me as someone writing this history was that the observatory saved everything. Letters, drafts of letters, incoming letters, out, copies of outgoing letters, boxes of materials. So this was a box of Miss Cannon's diaries. And as I recall, there were two boxes of of her diaries. This is a snippet of a page from a five year diary. So she would come back every five years. Um, uh, not the easiest handwriting to read, but but you get the hang of it after a while. Uh, I love this one in 1941. She was uh, classifying from 130. Cecilia brought me home at 415. So Cecilia was Cecilia Payne Gapashkin, uh, one, one of the more famous members of this group. Um, it was very important to Pickering to have the entire sky, not just the Northern Hemisphere. So he sent, he had funding to build a satellite observatory and sent an expedition party to South America. And they first set up a uh, Mount Harvard on, uh, on some mountaintop that proved not really, not really ideal. Uh, but eventually they got it together near the town of Arequipa in Peru, uh, in the lee of uh, a volcano called El Misti, which uh, was believed to be extinct. And uh, so now they have a uh, director's residence, several buildings that house, this is actually a, a telescope building with a slide off roof. And uh, here is a, a serious looking telescope dome. And this is the telescope 
in that dome. This is the Bruce telescope named for Catherine Wolfe Bruce, another heiress who got interested in astronomy and charmed by Pickering and was willing to write him a check for $50,000 uh, to build this instrument. And uh, uh, this, this one took very large format plates. Most of the plates are about eight by 10, but these were 14 by 17. And these are the people who worked at the observatory. This is uh, Solon Bailey. So he, he was the um, one of the early directors there. And this is his wife, Ruth Bailey. And uh, she went through all the trials and difficulties with him and did a lot of meteorology. They, they really made a very careful study of the meteorology of the area, uh, in addition to the astronomy. Uh, this is Delisle Stewart, and uh, I believe this is, yeah, this is, this is his wife. Bailey was particularly interested in the globular clusters, uh, these dense agglomerations of stars. And uh, how many stars would you think are, are gathered in an image like this? That was the question. And uh, the only way to find out, this was something the Baileys worked on together as a couple, they would, they would take another, a blank glass plate and, and make a, a, a ruled grid on it like a sheet of graph paper and hold that over the, um, the photographic plate. And then they would just make a count in each box and make a tally. And if their numbers didn't agree, they averaged them. And of course, when they, when they got to the center, there, there was no way to make a count. They just had to estimate. But all the plate analysis went on back in Cambridge. So uh, the staff, the staff grew. Uh, this is Miss Cannon. Uh, here's Pickering, still older. Uh, I think none of the other people I've named are in this picture. Some of them had already died and some were just away on other business at this point. But this this is the um, uh, the brick building. Henrietta Levitt was the first member of this group whose name I ever learned. I was interviewing Wendy Friedman when she was in charge of the Hubble Telescope Key Project about the expansion rate of the universe. And she made a point of telling me that a discovery by this woman who lived 100 years ago was a crucial part of determining the distant scale of the universe and, and, and the stars that she had studied were still being used in the Key Project as as distance markers and i i was duly impressed and amazed by that story and when i went to learn more about henrietta levitt i discovered that in fact there had been many many women all working together in this unusual place at harvard university not a place that had ever been associated in my mind with good opportunities for women. Uh, but the, the observatory was really separate from the university, it made its own rules and own judgments. And Pickering was extremely open-minded and, and welcoming to women. 
Uh, Miss Levitt was not looking at spectra. She was really working on the relative brightness of the stars. And these instruments were her domain. These are called fly spankers, uh, which I, I believe was her term. And she liked to make a joke that um, they were called fly spankers because they were too small to do a fly much damage. So they obviously look like fly swatters, but they are tiny. They're only, the, the handles are only about three inches long. And where the mesh of a fly swatter would be, there are little uh, sections of glass plates showing some number of stars and the magnitude or brightness of those stars has already been determined and written as a legend on these little rectangles of glass. And then the technique was to hold one of these over a plate that you were studying. And that way <clears throat> you had a handy reference for judging the magnitude of any star in the photograph. Excuse me. And this is a, a typical plate that she would study. <coughs> this again is the small Magellanic cloud where she noticed um, many variable stars. She discovered 2000 variable stars in the small and large Magellanic clouds. At the time of this work, there, there were very few variable stars known when the Harvard Photography Project started, maybe 200. And so by the end of Henrietta Leavitt's career, uh, she had discovered more, far more than half the known variable stars. But instead of just noting the, the different magnitudes, um, she realized that since, since all the stars were in this one locus, the stars that looked brighter really were brighter. It, it was not a, a distance. They, they were not looking brighter because they were much closer. They were looking brighter because they really were brighter. And then she noticed that in these variable stars, the ones that attained the greatest brightness in their cycle also had the longest cycle. And she, she wrote about that in a note that um, Pickering uh, urged her to publish. Uh, she did publish it. And then she studied it some more. She, she really followed about 25 stars and it held true and it seemed extremely significant. And in publishing her finding, Pickering referred to her discovery as a law. Uh, lately, it's become fashionable to call the period luminosity relation that Henrietta Leavitt discovered the Leavitt law. Uh, but Pickering was actually way ahead of, way ahead of us in that as in many other things. So here's Miss Levitt again uh, with Miss Cannon in front of the brick building. And th th these two ladies were internationally famous in their, in their lifetimes. Uh, Miss Cannon was an officer of the American Astronomical Society. Um, she traveled widely. She even went to Arequipa and made her own observations in, in South America when she was in her 50s, late 50s. Um, Miss Levitt didn't live that long. Uh, she, had, she had cancer uh, and died in her 50s. And uh, not long after her death, an admiring astronomer in uh, in Stockholm was interested in nominating her for a Nobel Prize, but um, the Nobel Prize is not 
awarded posthumously. Um, I mentioned Mariah Mitchell earlier. So Mariah Mitchell was from Nantucket and she had many relatives on the island of Nantucket who were interested in, in having a, an astronomy presence on the island after Miss Mitchell had died. And so the idea was to bring a young woman to the island for the summer, a six month period that would include the summer, to teach astronomy to the locals, make observations, and, um, and, and keep, keep astronomy alive. So uh, this is Margaret Harwood, who had been a Radcliffe student and then went to work at the Harvard Observatory. And she became the first uh, person to hold this position at the, at the Mariah Mitchell Observatory on Nantucket. And there was a very close relationship between the Mariah Mitchell Observatory and the Harvard Observatory. This is a famous picture of, of the Harvard women. This is Annie Jump Cannon. This is Henrietta Leavitt. Uh, but there are a lot of fresh young faces here. And these are, uh, uh, the young people are the Pickering Fellows. So thanks in part to the Nantucket connection, a, uh, a contribution was made to Harvard to, uh, to be a, a scholarship for a young woman to come and work at the observatory for a year and then be able to go take a job at another observatory. And um, the donors wanted to call this, this scholarship uh, the Harvard Women's Scholarship, but the university didn't, didn't want its name used so ca casually. So it, it became the, the Pickering Fellowship for Women. And after Pickering died and uh, Harlow Shapley became the director of the observatory, he really felt that this should be a graduate school in astronomy at Harvard, that the observatory had been in the business of increasing knowledge, but it wasn't producing the next generation of astronomers. And uh, he was determined to bring in graduate students. Graduate students need graduate student fellowships. And the only money he had were the Pickering Fellowships for Women. So the first several graduate students at Harvard in the, in the field of astronomy were all women recruited from the women's colleges because of this history. So um, this is Adelaide Ames. Uh, this is Helen Sawyer, later Helen Sawyer Hogg. Uh, the first male graduate student was Frank Hogg and that was, that was an easy match. Uh, and this is Cecilia Payne, who came from uh, came to Cambridge from Cambridge in England, and became very famous and rightfully so. So she was interested in coming to Harvard, partly because she knew there were opportunities for women there, and there were not comparable opportunities in England. Also, she was especially interested in the glass plates and in using the plates of spectra to really look at this question of chemical composition and figure out not only which chemicals, but how much of each. And for her doctoral dissertation, she was willing to say in print against all expectations. The, the, the expectation was that the, uh, the, the chemical abundances in the stars 
would not be that different from, from abundances on the earth. The elements were the same. Uh, so so that, that was the expectation. But when she studied it, hydrogen just swamped everything else, followed closely by helium and not closely by anything else. And it just, it just seemed impossible. She thought at first it must be a mistake, but her calculations always came out the same way. And uh, so she did publish that finding in her dissertation and uh, with the acknowledgement that it was unusual and might, um, might prove wrong, but it wasn't wrong. And it didn't take long for the entire astronomical community to come around to her way of thinking. And uh, so she was the first person to earn a doctoral degree in astronomy from Harvard University. Not the first woman, the first person. Of course, the degree had to be conferred through Radcliffe. Um, so it was uh, not all work and no play at the observatory. This is the staging of a, a humorous light opera called The Observatory Pinafore. And uh, here is Miss Payne in the leading role. She had a wonderful singing voice. She was also a talented violinist. Um, I, I have always been struck by how many astronomers are also musical. It's, uh, it no longer surprises me. Um, Miss Cannon was recognized, she won numerous awards. And one of, one of the awards she received gave her the idea to create her own reward award that could be given to promising young women astronomers. And so she developed the Annie Jump Cannon Prize, which she wanted to, um, to, to have given by the American Astronomical Society. And they agreed to that. And uh, it, was, it was to be a, a monetary award from the funds that she had been given. The original $1,000 of her prize was to be invested and then it would grow over the years. Um, but she also felt strongly that each recipient should get a, a, a pin. This, this was a pin that could be worn either on a chain as a necklace or as a brooch. And she had this designed and made by a, uh, a, a woman jeweler she knew. And then there were a series of jewelers because each time the prize was awarded, there had to be a new astronomical image. Um, that prize continues to the present day. Here are some recent winners. There was a huge flap about the prize in 1971 when Margaret Burbage was selected and didn't want it and used the occasion to speak up about the, the low representation of, of women in positions of importance in astronomy, in the field of astronomy at all, uh, and particularly in professorships and prestigious prizes. And so some people wanted to abolish the Anning Jump Cannon Prize. Some people wanted to make it open to men as well as women. It took a few years and finally, and it was given over to the American Association of University Women for several decades, but it's back with the American Astronomical Society now. And, uh, and it's not just, they don't get a pin anymore, but they do get a monetary prize, but more important, they get to deliver a prestigious lecture at the annual meeting. And that, that really helps uh, their careers. Um, so I talked before about the brick building, uh, and this is the interior of the building. So these are 
two photographs. This is the same young woman in each picture. She is Lindsay Smith Zrule, who is the current Mrs. Fleming. That title, the curator of astronomical photographs, still exists. And I believe that Lindsay's salary actually comes from the original bequest that Mrs. Draper left to fund the ongoing care of the plates and their study. So these are the plates. Each one is in a paper envelope. They're very uh, carefully organized. There's a card catalog. Uh, and these are the logbooks that all the, the notations were, were made in. Um, everything is in the process of digitization. Uh, the, uh, the digitization process is called digital access to a sky century at Harvard, because the plates really do cover 100 years. This is a, this is one from the 1950s. The, um, the Arequipa station had been moved to South Africa by that point. But of course, they were still in the Southern Hemisphere. So they could see the southern reaches of the Milky Way. Um, this is how the lower level of the plate stacks looked on a morning in January of 2016, when a water main burst and several buildings were flooded. And uh, quite a number of the plates were in that mess. Um, also, the custom built scanning apparatus for digitizing the glass plates was flooded. But volunteers came and carried out, carried the plates out to uh, safekeeping, which at the moment, the, um, the preservation experts at the university archives said, get them someplace that's cold and dry. So just getting them outside in January in Cambridge, and it was, wasn't raining or snowing. So outside was good. And then trucks came and, and took the plates to a uh, restoration facility where they were dried and cleaned and just about everything survived. And the insurance money paid to replace all the digitization, the scanning, computers, everything that had gotten wrecked in the flood. So they were they were back up and running very soon and have have issued many data releases. And you can you can find those online. Those are publicly available. Uh, Probably many of you saw this movie. This movie really stole some of the thunder from my book, I have to say, <laughs> but it was a great story. Uh, this person uh, is Alyssa Goodman. She is a professor of astronomy at Harvard, and she is one of the people I asked to read my manuscript as a technical expert. And she, she had the strangest experience because, of course, she knew who these women were. She knew their names. But when she was reading in my manuscript about what they had done, she found herself constantly astounded. And she admitted to me that she had always thought that they were just doing something quaint or cute. Uh, she had never, never realized that they were actually doing science. Uh, but they really were. Uh, there's been no movie made yet about my book, but there are a couple of plays written about the Harvard women, and, and here they are as, as Lego characters. So uh, this is Miss Levitt, uh, uh, Miss Cannon, and and Miss Payne.
and this is this is one of my favorite images of them uh this is from about 1925 so this is antonia mori she she periodically left the observatory but came back and continued her work uh so there she is here's miss cannon uh elderly but you see she's she's still working not not even bothering to look up at the camera this is margaret harwood uh this is cecilia payne and uh some people look at the these groups of these women working they they feel it reminds them of a a quilting bee or a sewing circle uh but as Alyssa goodman said they were really doing science and it, it's also quite typical to deride this work as not all that interesting not all that difficult uh something that just required patience but in fact uh they were entrusted with the raw material to make the analyses and the discoveries and that's what they did and I feel confident that if any of them had been interviewed alongside any of the telescope operators, nobody, nobody, no individual thought my job is boring. They all, they were all really interested in what they were doing. And as far as I could tell, uh, really loved what they did. Uh, so that that is my last image. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, I'll, then I'll come back and I'm going to applaud on behalf of everybody because oh, okay. one big downside, of course, of virtual lectures and virtual talks is there's no big audience at the end. So I, I will I will applaud on there behalf is a cat. of everyone. Um, but uh, I, I, I suspect that you know you you entertain a large number of people. Many pe shout outs to your work in the past, um, this book, other books of yours, uh, in the YouTube chat. So uh, this was this was wonderful. So thank you very much on behalf of everyone. I'm going to applaud, and uh, we'll we'll start taking questions. So please feel free to use the chat if you have any questions. Uh, we have a couple to start, and uh, I can see that some more are likely coming. So the very first question that we have is coming from uh, someone. Uh, so uh, I'm going to try to uh, pronounce everyone's name, but uh, coming from Craig Jones. Were there any group uh, comparable groups of women doing this kind of science in the UK or Europe or Japan, um, just anywhere else in the world? No. No, <laughs> no. In fact, when uh, Miss Cannon traveled in England, she she was interested in that. She she, mm -hmm. she was always looking to see if there were other women. And one of the first things she wrote was she visited Greenwich and she said there are no female assistants. Uh, there were some at uh, in California at at Mount Wilson, um, and that may have started because of the group at Harvard. Okay. Do you know, um, just to follow up on that, do you know what or who was uh, involved in getting the very first women at Harvard Observatory um, before Pickering's time? Yes. So the first director, uh, Bond, had uh, a daughter who started working as a computer in the observatory. And uh, uh, William Cranch Bond was the first director's name. But his son, George Phillips Bond, took over as the second director. And so he had his sister working. And his daughters also mm -hmm. became computers. The, the, the third director's daughter, two daughters worked under Pickering. So it, it was a family business. Mm -hmm. A lot of, in, in many areas of science, the, 
the person of record had a female family member as a willing assistant mm -hmm. who, who didn't usually get any kind of acknowledgement. Darwin's wife was 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 an assistant in his okay. work with earthworms and and probably some other projects too. But that that was just typical of the time. All right, excellent. Thank you. Uh, coming from uh, Alistair McLean, uh, are the harbor plates still of interest to astronomers? Yes, they are, which is why they're being digitized. So the last plate I showed that was that magnificent field of stars, the wealth of information that is in that plate and that's just one example, has never been fully analyzed. There were never enough people to look at every star and every image. But now with time domain astronomy, mm -hmm. there's tremendous interest in knowing what was, what was where 100 years ago. And so uh, the digitization is, is co considered essential. And if you mean, are the original plates still of interest? Probably less so. People used to actually visit the observatory to look at the plates if, if they needed to see what that part of the sky looked like decades earlier. In Pickering's day, if you were really interested in something, he would send you the plates. They don't do that anymore. They're a little delicate, I imagine. They're a little delicate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, I'm sure some people are really nervous. What's going to happen to the plates once they're digitized? Uh, and I don't know the answer to that question. But I'm, I'm confident that some number of them will be preserved. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the spectrum plates are not part of the digitization. So. Excellent, thank you. Uh, this is coming from Chris Vaughn, uh, wondering due to the lower pay scale, how many additional computers could be employed at Harvard Observatory than if they were men? Uh, how lucky uh, science has been as a result of these talented women? Yeah, uh, four. four. So yeah, four, four. For for one man, you could get four women. So it's a four to one yeah. ratio. Amazing. Um, uh, yeah, I can see why uh, there was extra hands for all of that work, but uh, it would have been nice to to um, to not have such a disparity. <laughs> um, this is coming from Doug Johnstone. The photo suggests that men and women were segregated much of the time. Was that common? At the beginning, they were really segregated. I mean, one of the reasons that women didn't observe was that it was considered unseemly to have them up in the observatory at night mm -hmm. uh, in a, in a co-ed situation. But that changed when Miss Cannon came, and they they weren't segregated so much as they were doing different jobs. So, if you noticed in the in the paper doll picture where they're all standing holding hands. There mm -hmm. are some men in that picture. Um, and they, it was a very social group. So they, the computers worked six days a week. But when they all socialized on Saturday night, everybody got together. Uh, and okay, excellent. And um, uh, was there any pushback for Annie Jump Cannon to observe either from other members of the observatory or um, from the, the university, or was it pretty pretty open to to her and she wanted to go and she could she could join? As far as I know, there was no pushback, and the work she was doing was was individual because she was using one of the smaller telescopes, mm -hmm. so she was up on the roof by herself. There, she might have had another person at another telescope up there with her at times, but she never she never recorded anything like that. Okay, excellent. Well, that's good to hear. Excellent. 
Uh, this is coming from Heather S. Could you repeat again about the drawing of stars? Was it Galileo's? Did he use a telescope? Yeah, so when Galileo heard about the telescope, this was in 1609, he never, he never saw one, but he heard all about it and what, he, what it could do. And so he built his own. And the first one had a magnification of, I think it was nine. Don't hold me to that, but I think it was <laughs> nine power. Yeah. And so he was, there was a big question in, in his day about what was the Milky Way? Mm -hmm. Was it, was it cloud? Was it dust? Was it, when he pointed the telescope at the Milky Way, he could see individual stars. Yeah. So that's what helped him realize it's, it's individual stars, but there are so many of them that it, that it looks like a cloud. And then he was looking at well-known constellations and showing how many more stars would appear if you look through the telescope. And he had a fairly wide, actually, he didn't have a wide field of view. Um, the images make it look as though he had a wide field of view. Uh, but I think that's because he was just drawing them that way. Mm -hmm. Th that's quite possibly the case. I mean, he, he definitely, uh, if you look at some of his drawings of Saturn and Jupiter, you know, they, they're, they're only focused on the planet. They're not focusing on anything outside of the planet. But he, but he did manage to discover the moons of Jupiter. Yes, indeed. And, and technically the rings of Saturn, though he did not know they were rings. He didn't know what they were. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is a question from Mark Richardson. You mentioned uh, quickly that uh, I believe it's Alpeca, the observatory that was um, originally in, in uh, South America, was placed in the lee of a volcano, but and was described as a then thought dormant volcano. Is there more to the story there? Did the <laughs> volcano erupt? Um, good question. So um, the town is uh, Arequipa. Arequipa, thank you. And there were Alpaca there um, in Arequipa. And the the volcano rumbled okay <laughs> it didn't <laughs> it didn't it didn't pour lava and hurt anyone the reason the astronomers left arequipa and moved to south africa was the weather changed mm. they the, somehow the fabulous clear sky that had drawn them there in the first place they they survived yellow fever outbreak I think they even had a plague outbreak at one time, um, but astronomers will put up with a lot for a clear sky. But when <laughs> when the sky quit, they were out of there, and uh, and the same fellow Solon Bailey, who had had done the exploration and picked that particular place in in South America, he went to South Africa, and again made the selection. They, they called him the uh, ambassador without portfolio. <laughs> and and how, how long does it take to survey and find a, a good site for a telescope at those days? More than a year. More than a year. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of effort. Yeah, traveling around, yep. making observations, watching how the weather changes over the year. Yeah. And um, so when they moved from South America to South Africa, did they dismantle the entire observatory and you know, ship it across? Or did they just take the telescope and leave the building behind? Oh, oh yeah, they left the buildings. Okay. And uh, anybody who's curious about the digitization project, the DASH website has a lot of historical photographs. And there is a picture of the Bruce building. It's been turned into a chapel. Mm. And the Bruce telescope went to South Africa, but then it was decommissioned and it is, it's in Cambridge now. It's back at Harvard as a, as a museum exhibit. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, this is a comment uh, from Sergio uh, Derugas, and apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, on the grounds of the National Observatory at 
Tonatadzidila, uh, again, apologies for the mispronunciation of the name. In the Mexican state of uh, Puebla, there is a street named after Annie Jump Cannon. Isn't that lovely? Yeah, yeah. that is quite nice. Yeah. And, and Mrs. Fleming was an honorary member of the Mexican Astronomical Society. Excellent. So thank you for letting us know that, Sergio. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful information. And I'll, I'll give a very quick um, Canadian connection to Helen uh, Sawyer Hogg, uh, you know, being oh, yes. a Canadian American astronomer. Uh, our Canadian Astronomical Society has a prize named after her. Um, and uh, that's given off uh, every year. So some of the Canadians on this call are listening in afterwards may recognize that name from, uh, from our own community. And she wrote, uh, an astronomy column for, was it the Toronto Star? I don't, I know she she wrote a, a column about mm -hmm. a popular astronomy column for many years. I'm sure somebody in the chat will will verify that. I do remember I, that, but I could not, I don't want to I specify could, the I, name I, of the I newspaper I can look it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, in between that, uh, we do have another question. Uh, oh, good, Jones. okay. Was anything lost in the digitization of plates? Like in the digitization process, is anything lost yes. that you can only get from the pure plates themselves, I think? Yes. The note, the handwritten notations. Mm. Because the plates have to be cleaned before they can be scanned. So they're photographed, the notations are photographed, but then they have to be wiped clean. That must be actually kind of sad to do, to, to take <laughs> away a little bit of that history and the spirit of those early astronomers that they embedded all those plates that you have to kind of wipe it clean. I mean, I understand for the digitization process, but at the same time, like once removed, you can't get it back. No, um, but now um, they're, they're definitely sensitive to that fact. Mm -hmm. And some number of plates are set aside as being too historically valuable. Of course. So they, they're just pristine or dirty as they are. Uh, they're, they're just not touched. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I actually have a couple of questions that I thought I would ask. So while we're waiting for other members of the, the live stream to continue with their wonderful questions, one thing I wanted to ask was, um, how did they select the women who ended up going to the observatory? A lot of the early ones were, you know, as you say, the, the daughters and sisters of directors, but were there a lot of applicants and what kind of selection criteria would they have used to distinguish between applicants for what were what you've basically said is a very prestigious and very rare opportunity? It was on the job training. Okay. So you didn't, at the beginning, you didn't have to have any particular kind of degree. One woman came from working in the insurance business. You had to be good with numbers. You had to be observant and willing to learn. That was really all at the beginning. Then because of the, the rise of the women's colleges and the possibility of, of bringing in actually experience, people with astronomy experience, mm -hmm. that was good too. But it, it still wasn't always required because it would, was unusual to be able to find it. Of course. And, and Mrs. Fleming was very good at, at screening and mm. deciding which, which young women she thought would, be, would work out well. So was there an interview process that she, that yes. she would interview? Oh, interesting. Yes. And uh, she also, she writes in, um, th there was a, a time capsule buried at Harvard. It was called the chest of 1900. And, <laughs> That's a and many people were asked to, to keep a, a, a diary of their activities over a period of, I think it was eight weeks. And she did that very, in her very devoted 
fastidious way. And, um, uh, and, and she talks about somebody who, who wanted to, who was so eager to work there that she was willing to volunteer. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Fleming wasn't having it because, oh, wow. you know, it, free work that wasn't good work was, was not worth the price. Wow, that that that's kind of harsh, but I I I, uh, I guess you have to respect yes. that. <laughs> All right, uh, coming from Eric Briggs, were some of the handwritten notes on the plates humorous or snarky? Oh, <laughs> oh, I love the idea of that. No, they weren't. They weren't like that at all. They were um, numbers, maybe a magnitude number or an identifier or uh, an arrow. The snarky comments, but even those weren't snarky, were written on the paper envelopes. Uh, do I have that handy? No, I don't. But each plate was in a paper envelope. Mm -hmm. And people working on the plates might say on the note, I, I don't, I don't know what I'm looking at it, or, you know, this uh, Pickering saw this here, but I think it's that. And then other people might look at that object and add a comment. So there's that, but there weren't, there weren't words. Um, and, and certainly not enough words to to have an attitude, no. But okay. that's, if, if anybody writes another movie about it, that, <laughs> I think that would be a great touch. Well, I mean, you want to be somewhat accurate. You don't want to misrepresent people who, who lived at one point, but uh, it could be a little humorous line to, to add in. Yeah. Um, so another question that I wanted to ask was, do you have a sense of just how much of the sky that they were able to map with both the Northern and the Southern Hemisphere telescopes? I, th I think they got it all. I, I'm not sure there was anything that they, they really couldn't see. It's quite a feat. Yeah. You know, modern day telescopes, they only map the whole sky if we launch them into space. Um, and even then, you know, it, it, it's a tour de force to do that. Um, well, there had been mapping projects before. There's the famous mm -hmm. French project, the Carte du Ciel, but that was, that was very complicated setting up whose area was which and yes. what kind of camera should be used and what size plate and it, and, and Pickering was involved in those discussions and, and got really impatient and felt, let's just do it. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's just take it on and do the whole thing. And, and he got some people angry at him because of that. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. They couldn't stay angry at him for long because <laughs> in addition to, to giving the women all these opportunities, he had an idea. So Miss Bruce, the one who funded the big telescope, she also wanted to give money to support incidental projects here and there. Mm -hmm. And she wanted Pickering to select them for her because she had no way of judging whose work was best. So he took that on and he advertised, you know, I have $6,000 at at, as, as a gift. I'm, I'm willing to give $500 to anybody, anywhere. Do you need to hire an assistant? Do you have um, some backlog of data to be in? Whatever it is. And so people applied and all the money disappeared quickly. And he thought, this is a really a great thing. Why don't we, why don't we keep this going? Mm -hmm. And he really thought that Harvard could be the repository of funds from not necessarily just Miss Bruce, but any place. And then it would be a central clearinghouse and he would find people elsewhere and give them money. And there was a lot of not trusting him to do it after he'd gone out of his way to, to make it happen. 
So. That's, a, that's some like really heavy business sense that you know you don't normally think of with scientists and 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 so forth. Uh, but you know that's that's some that's some planning. That's uh, some yeah, and, and also the idea of we're not going we're not going to just make the observations. We're not going to just take all these pictures. Mm -hmm. We're going to hire people to look at the images and and make discoveries. Yes, and then. We're going to have to pay to store the images. We're going to have to make a building to mm -hmm. store the images. And somebody's going to be in charge of upkeep and preservation, whatever is required. So mm -hmm. Mrs. Draper, after giving them nearly $10,000 a year for the rest of her life, left them a huge sum in her will. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, in those days, I mean, I don't know inflation, but, you know, that's a lot of money even today. A lot of money. hundred years yeah. ago, that that's, must have been a substantial sum. Yeah. Substantial sum. All right. So we have a few more questions from our live stream. Uh, Marina Milner Bulletin asks, how did you become a science writer? Your books are based on significant research, and yet you always tell the story that is understandable by regular people. Thank you. What a nice thing to say. I uh, became a science writer because I was always interested in science, but I couldn't really see myself as a scientist. And I really, I really liked to write. If somebody had told me when I was in high school that there was a job description called science writer, I would have said, Oh, that's what I want to do. But I, I didn't hear that term till I had been through, I think it was five majors at three colleges. It took me five years to finish college because I kept switching. Mm -hmm. I was just lost. And I fell into it backwards is, is the truth. So, um, but, but once there, uh, I had a, a job at a newspaper as a features writer in the, on the women's pages, which gave me freedom to write about whatever I was interested in, and I was interested in science. So, so I was doing it before I knew that that was called science writing. Um, and here I am. Yeah, no, wonderful. Still doing it. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, uh, so this is coming from Stefan Courteau, who's asking, uh, what project are you currently working on? If you can share. I, I share. I, I, like, I like to let it be known as a way to tell anybody else, please don't do this because, because <laughs> I'm doing it. Um, so uh, just around the time the pandemic started, I was asked to review a book called Women in Their Element, and probably because I'd written The Glass Universe. So this was a book about women chemists. It's a very clever title, Women yeah. in Their Element. And it was a, about 35 vignettes of, of women chemists by all different authors, a, a collection of, mm. of brief biographies. And I, I was just, stopped by the fact that so many of them at one point or another had worked for Marie Curie. You know, I'd never heard that, that she hired women. And it turns out because her husband died very young and she was allowed to take over uh, not only his laboratory, but his professorship at the Sorbonne, unprecedented. She was the mm -hmm. first, first woman to be a professor at the Sorbonne. So that, that really made her a, an icon and, and a magnet for young women interested in science. And she would never have described herself as a, as a feminist, as someone trying to make opportunities for women, but she made them. Mm hmm. And um, so that's my story. All and, right. Uh, the title is uh, working title in Madame Curie's lab. And there are about 
40 women. A span of how many years? 40 women? From 1906, when she took over, till 1934, when she died. Okay. That's, that's an impressive group going through one lab. Excellent, excellent. Um, including okay, her we're, daughter. We're, hmm? Including her daughter. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> All right, we have a few more questions from uh, the live stream. Uh, from Alan Dyer. Uh, how long did the manual work? Alan Dyer, hello. Oh, excellent. <laughs> how long did the manual work of inspecting and classifying stars from plates continue? Uh, from the photos, it looked like there was a second and third generation of computers. When was yeah. the last generation of computers? So Miss Cannon died, I think, in 1941. Um, after World War II, things really changed because there were computers, mm -hmm. non-human computers. And that was the big change. Okay. So, and, and so from, so up until around the second world war. Yeah, so starting Pickering came in 1877. Okay. There were already women there and he hired more through the 1940s. Okay, so you know, good part of a of a hundred years uh, from start to finish. That's pretty impressive, very impressive. And so the first part of the question was, how long did the manual work of the ins of inspecting the plates take? Um, from you know... well, it it was never finished. It, it was ongoing. You you could never say that you'd really finished a plate. I mean, if you had a single spectrum of a star, mm -hmm. you could do. But if you look at those other plates. There's, there's really not a limit to the time. And then Miss Cannon liked to go back to plates she'd already examined okay. and redo them to make sure she would make the same judgment. Which is good science, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Very good science, very good practice to, to you know, if you can replicate your, your answer, then you're more sure of it uh, each time you try it out. So that's excellent. Uh, and I've been told by our uh, technical team in the back that Alan says hello to you as well. Okay, nice, okay. <laughs> um, so I think we'll end off with this last question from Phil Somers. Did some of the women get asteroids named after them? Yes. Uh, oh yes, and not only asteroids, but uh, there's a Fleming crater on the moon. Oh, lovely. Uh, because that's shared with Alexander Fleming. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I think, I think there may even be some, some features on Venus. Maybe, I, you know, I, I, I think I'm, I could be wrong about that, but on, um, on the asteroid Eros, there's a feature named for Marina Gamba, who was the mother of, of Galileo's children. So oh, because the features are named for famous lovers. <laughs> that That's actually very appropriate given the name of the asteroid. <laughs> that's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I think that's a wonderful note to end it on. So I want to thank you again, Deva, for joining us virtually. Um, for our 2021 CAVE lecture. It's been an absolute pleasure to host you. Uh, hopefully we get to host you in person. So wonderful to thank you in person. Um, again, I'm going to applaud on behalf of everyone in the audience. Um, and thank you to those who joined our live chat and to those who asked questions. Um, I hope we can all see you again in the next year for the next CAVE lecture when we are able to meet again in person. All right. Uh, I think I should probably end this because I have a very chatty cat in the background. <laughs> but, uh, he has the last everybody. word. Um, and uh, I think we're we're done for, for this cave lecture. So once again, I will applaud on behalf of everybody to our wonderful speaker, uh, Deva Sobel. Thank you. The stream is over. <laughs>